Jin Chow, hello there. Perry Tim's here. Pleased to be speaking to you and sorry that I can't be there in person with you today, but I hope this video is a good replacement for me being with you uh, and hope to continue the conversations with you online uh, at a future point. So yeah, um, today we're going to be looking at how we navigate the future and particularly from an HR perspective, how we look at people and the work that we do that helps organizations navigate the future. So I'm just gonna share screen and bring my slides up and I'll talk across those and help us understand what the future really is. Uh, to some, the future is very scary and certain. And of course, uh, we've seen reactions to the pandemic that have put the future in doubt. But let's have a look into what we mean by the future when we're talking about people, their performance and the role of HR in the world of work. So a little about me, um, I'm the founder and chief energy officer of People and Transformational HR Limited um, uh, based in the United Kingdom, um, but we operate on a global basis. I'm a chartered member of the CIPD and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. Uh, I've written two books, uh, Transformational HR First and Second Edition and The Energised Workplace. There are two TEDx uh, speeches of mine you can catch online. Um, I'm also a visiting professor at four business schools in the UK uh, and a LinkedIn learning instructor with two lessons about HR and employee relations. And what we're going to uh, look at today is uh, the future of work, but for uh, the current uh, slide, you can see the kind of present uh, state of the organisation that I run. Um, we're a small but very proud organisation trying to create a better business for a better world. We're a pending certified B Corporation organisation um, and 2021 also saw us become a climate positive organisation. Um, we're a four day working week gold standard employer and we're a living wage employer as well. And our mission and our work is to help transform teams and the way they operate to help people flourish in their work. We do that through people-powered change, agile, autonomous, inclusive ways of working. Uh, we focus heavily on design and systems thinking, the energy of people at work, and we also help create the next stages in organisation design and conscious business models. These are some of the clients that we operate with. Um, some brands you may know, some you may not, but a broad section of charitable, uh, private sector, public sector, organisations of different sizes, and the majority of these organisations help us uh, to uh, realise our ambition, but also we work with their HR teams to improve the working performance and lives of people in those companies. So let's have a look at the change in lenses as work, of work as our sort of starting point really here. Um, if we look on the left, um, prior to the pandemic particularly, but um, I guess uh, increasingly being challenged by advancing technologies and different approaches to work, work was about place, a full-time role, a job, using digital tools in many ways, and operating in divisional or functional structures um, as part of an organisation. On the right, you'll see the potential and actual shifts that are already starting to occur, um, be they working in a hybrid sense, um, remote and on site, uh, different ways to um, shape the week. Uh, so flexible working as a, a more dominant source uh, of uh, method and model for people's work, uh, working on projects um, supported by and enabled automation operating in networks and hubs, and being part of a platform enterprise. So I'm gonna unpack those for you and give you a sense of the operating world for HR before we actually specifically zoom into HR. So let's start with place. Um, everybody went to work as an association with work that is to do with a physical premise. And of course, in many roles, uh, going to a place of work is still absolutely unquestionable because it is about serving people, uh, caring for them, operating machinery, 
and so on and so forth. So the majority of people are still attached to some form of place of work. Um, uh, and then there are others who can choose uh, where to work. And so that's what's really brought to light, I suppose, the nature of, uh, in, in this case, particularly office work, knowledge work, desk based activities because that place uh, existed uh, for well over 100 years, particularly in office, uh, that people would come to operate um, technological machinery, uh, they would access files and information, they would work along teammates and colleagues and have a, a manager with them, um, operating from a building or buildings, um, up to the pandemic, of course. Uh, and that forced into reality um, a shift to home-based working where people were operating on a device in their own home, connecting to the internet and uh, uh, supporting uh, their work and their colleagues um, remotely. So that's, you know, a one to two year kind of experiment forced upon the world. And what seems to be the outcome coming from this um, experiment is that people are now talking about options and flexibility because they've discovered a different balance to life, they have created different rhythms to how they live and work. And so the uh, model that's being talked about is hybrid. So we've really gone from either in the office or out of the office to this mixture of the two uh, and or different places to work, remote satellite offices or co-working spaces or whatever it might be. So in this example, what we're seeing is no longer just a slide, but maybe a third dimension uh, where we're talking about a place of work that is um, less about physical proximity and more about where people connect uh, in order to do their work. So lots of research currently um, underway in this space and lots of experiments and lots of um, uh, reveals from people. But I think the future we have to think about of a workplace is that it's more likely to start from the point of a kind of hybrid concept um, and then a workable solution that balances uh, people's needs and the organization's needs. And the model of work uh, largely was this uh, five day working week, uh, full time hours, uh, depending on the country that you operate in. Those hours would sometimes be different between 35, 40 uh, and beyond. And so that model has prevailed again for uh, probably well over 100 years. Um, but we're now seeing some experiments into four day uh, working weeks. Uh, and indeed, the organisation I have is a four day operating week organisation. So four, three, four days at work, three days um, for a longer weekend or three days at work and a four day even longer kind of break from the working environment or the pattern uh, that the company I operate works to two days on one off two days on two off so Monday Tuesday on Wednesday off Thursday Friday on and Saturday Sunday off so yeah really interesting shifts um, experiments in Iceland uh, current uh, legislation uh, being looked at in the US Congress, uh, France, Spain and Scotland, uh, all looking at four day working weeks, create more jobs, give more flexibility and create more adaptability is often the rationale behind this shift. So potentially uh, we are looking at a shift in when we work as well as where we work. And what we actually do is currently framed largely by uh, an HR uh, creation, uh, the job description. And the job description is meant to be a distillation of all the responsibilities, and it helps us understand how to recruit people to that work and how to measure people's success and continued delivery through that particular uh, vehicle, the job description. It tells you what you're there to do, how to do it, what standards to apply. But I think that's becoming increasingly challenged by the complexity of work, uh, the challenges and the problems and the issues and the adaptability we're having to face means a job description that's set is possibly no longer relevant. And we're starting to see a shift uh, towards more project orientation. So instead of having fixed key responsibilities, uh, we're starting to see a shift that focuses more on key outcomes of your work, the value that you create, the impact that you have. So instead of repeatable tasks and key performance indicators, we're looking at some core roles that you're there to perform, administration, specialist advice, uh, technical capability, professional application, 
And so they become your core role attributes. And then we focus on the impact that you have with the advice, the guidance, the support, uh, and the professionalism that you bring into that particular role. Um, and even behaviours, we've gone from a standardised set of behaviours uh, for particular roles into being much more adaptable. So being able to be creative and um, understanding uh, adaptations to processes that are both fair and compliant. Uh, and so we're going more into um, uh, an area where we don't expect people to operate by a very strict code, but they adopt principles and they adjust them to the service that's needed for their colleagues and for their customers. So we often call that in HR a developed set of competencies, and I think we're now starting to see that it's really also that and future capabilities. So what are we good at now, but also what can we uh, stretch to in the future and need to uh, acquire as capabilities in the future? Um, an example here would be um, the ability to work with automated bots and scripts. Uh, and not just use technology as a kind of an information creation and dispersal uh, platform. Learning programmes, so training courses, study programmes, that kind of thing, um, is often now questioned about timeliness and about um, absorbability. Um, so what we're starting to see is a shift already into people having skills and experiences in the flow of their work, learning on the job, uh, with projects and stretch assignments, with regularised coaching and mentoring, additional contributions from online content, on-demand, smaller, modular-based learning is starting to become the norm, uh, rather than long programmes that maybe aren't timely enough and are quite a lot to absorb and apply. So the job orientation is moving from something being very fixed to something that helps with the fluctuating demands of work and solving new novel problems that come our way. And so instead of having project time as almost like an overdrawn element to our uh, working day and working alongside uh, our core responsibilities, projects and, and the core responsibilities become a balanced um, equation for you to calculate on a daily basis so that you don't have uh, too uh, uh, overbearing a stack of responsibilities and that you can absorb them and work mainly on projects, but with your core role as the reason you're working on those projects, advising on data analytics, uh, helping with customer insight and understanding the needs of um, uh, both future and present partners and suppliers. Um, so we've gone from work that is um, values linked so that we have a set of corporate values and we link everything we do to them to a, being a much more principles based operation so that those values have more depth and adaptability in, in the situations we face. So it's not about compromising, it's about suitability so that we understand the nature of what drives our behaviours, our decisions and ultimately our actions. So we've gone from planned work, which is sometimes very difficult to do with fluctuating challenges such as a pandemic and the responses to it, to just being prepared, just being able to apply um, strongly sensed and founded principles and adapted processes and practices. So um, preparation rather than really, really strongly cast plans, which may not survive their first point of contact with the real world. So that's a big shift that I think HR has to navigate, less rigid jobs and more fluid project orientation. And of course, those digital tools I talked about really help us understand how we connect, how we uh, utilise information, how we create information and how we service and deliver our work in many, many ways. So we've seen a shift here already, or we are starting to see uh, indeed some shifts from email and inboxes to an email um, function being good for external contact, but internally operating in a thread based communication like Microsoft Teams or Slack. So that internally it's a little less formal and more rapid and more deployable and asynchronous. And email is for our external exchanges with people outside of our domain and our calendars that are often open for people to book meetings in, which are often hijacked. 
we're now starting to see automated tools that can help us with focus, deep working time, uh, avoid meeting clashes, help with um, proximity to others, availability, and create shorter meetings that are more powerful, but that don't take so much time and are actually getting in the way of doing the work. We've also gone from shared drives of lots of information that we create and store to cloud-based searchable insights. So this is an important shift for us that we can utilize information much more readily and tools and technology can help us do that. Um, document attachments and version control and this constant sort of routine of editable documents. Instead, we're having more open, uh, multi-user real-time editing on documents and, and decks and, and products and services uh, that that impacts on. Um, and so we've got this constant barrage of Microsoft Teams calls or Zoom calls, um, and we're moving from that into much more of the creative connections and conversations that I think technology will enable us to do. So be prepared to see some significant shifts in video calling and how we do that as a result of understanding phenomena like uh, Zoom fatigue. And the company may have invested in a huge enterprise system that handles end-to-end -end workflow and all of the information that supports that. But I think we're now going to start to see much more of the smarter type of systems that can help us manage workflow allocation, uh, information storage and retrieval, and also keep it safe and encrypted. Um, ransomware and cyber attacks are a huge threat to organizations' functional capability and also um, their financial stability. And so I think from an HR perspective, we're going from an information system that stores people related data and context to something that integrates within work that we can access and, and draw information from and put information into. It can help us with our learning programs and it can learn what we are um, doing in learning and our preferences are and it can feed us information and stimulate us to take breaks look after ourselves and learn constantly on the go so there's a lot of promise from automated tools helping us become more efficient and effective and within that we can also look at the structure of organizations often functionally set around divisions of specific um, capabilities, operations, marketing, finance, HR, and so on. But now I think we're starting to see the shift from that into more networks and hubs and circles. Uh, so from fixed units, we're starting to see people become more deployable in an agile way to swarm to problems and to create uh, opportunities through collective uh, and uh, diverse uh, perspectives. So our information stored in silos is often locked and difficult to access. So I think the advent of knowledge hubs, where it's much more a shared space for information and data, is likely to be something we'll see a lot more of. And then instead of having innovation specialists, people who are secured and brought into play when there's a particular need, um, the potential for something like tiger teams who are interested people who come together to create something innovative uh, uh, in the moment, responding to customer feedback or employee need. And then we've got subject matter experts who sit in various roles within our functions who will converge into communities of practice and create much more dynamic and connectedness around their skills and knowledge and experience. Learning programs become more about experiential huddles. Uh, we don't just go up a promotion ladder, we have pathways. So instead of a management ascendancy, it's probably about skills, diversification, and a sort of portfolio of skills for you to create. Instead of a nine box talent grid, uh, we'll see people embark on tours of duty to experience different functions and, and domains and test their capabilities and acquire new skills in that in that way. So instead of verticals and exclusive gradist approaches, it's likely to be horizontal, diagonal and much more inclusive. So learning has a huge part to play um, in our future. And of course, HR has an enormous part to play in the learning situation. So organisations then, uh, when we talk about organisations, we think of the brand, we think of the size and the scale, the global footprint, the numbers of people working in them. Um, and I think there is a chance to reinvent the nature of the organization into becoming what I've called a platformed enterprise. 
So it's a mixture of being value oriented. So what it stands for in the world, but also values powered so that those values really drive its sense of ethics and performance in a really nice combination that's both fair and profitable. So it's growth based, but it's also hypothesis driven. So it can grow and acquire market share and, and uh, additional companies, but also be driven by the sense of uh, questions it asks of the world. And something that leans into the learning nature of individuals that organizations themselves become these learning vessels, these machineries that embark on learning and discovery as part of who they are, not just their products and services. And in order to do that, they'll need to be a bit more open in terms of their information sharing, storage and access. So rather than a set of encyclopedias, they'll be like this dynamically updated Wikipedia. So they'll be um, uh, multitasking, exploitative and explorative. And in this state of constant change, uh, but being safe about curiosity and experimentation. So organisations will have a really strong opportunity to become more socialised and networked, still scalable, but very adaptive uh, around uh, how they collaborate and agree with people how to operate. So how do we navigate into that future then? We've got an opportunity to think uh, within our own domains and our individual teams and, and us. But in order to do that, we've got to pause and, and start to reflect because it's very important we can um, uh, take on that uh, vast amount of information that's out there about future possibilities in order for us to go into a, a state of reimagination. And I think in order to do that, this is almost like my, my playbook for how we can start to create a navigable future. Um, look at the problems uh, that you're facing. What are we um, up against? What are we challenged by? Think about the opportunities that you wanted to start to um, create and, and capitalise upon. And then think about those misalignments where things aren't working quite as they should. And in that respect, then you can set some principles of how you want to tackle those three areas and be very responsive about how you deploy to that. Uh, so that you're open to new opportunities, uh, but you can stick to a plan uh, and a timetable and investment that you want to set. Uh, in many respects, you might have to take down some things that exist and rebuild them. Uh, and then that results uh, in uh, an opportunity for you to experiment, uh, to reveal some evidence and enable you to actually start uh, to operate in a new way. And then do the same again, pause, reflect, reimagine. So I think a constant cycle here of how to navigate the future is built around this adaptation. And for HR specifically, um, I did some research recently uh, looking at an enormous amount of uh, white papers, uh, projections, models and perspectives on the future. And so for HR, very specifically, it was about redefining what HR is there to do in the post 2021 version of the world to redesign how it operates and to renew those things that give strength, uh, credibility, support and enablement to people in the systems of work. Um, there's no doubt we've created some momentum uh, because we've um, had to adapt to the pandemic and look after people and really step in with new arrangements for work, new support mechanisms, new ways of operating. We've also had to be very considerate to well-being, so um, so not just uh, how people are in, in a sort of a, a sense of response to um, contracting COVID nineteen, but also just generally with mental health and awareness of fatigue and stress and all the uncertainty that's in the world. We've also got to really get into that strong um, uh, understanding of the skills agenda for the next stage of our evolution in the workplace, and remix some of those things that we're good at. Uh, and some of the things we need to take account of in terms of performance and reward uh, and career pathways. Uh, so yes, yeah, so coming out in September, the state of HR 2021, compiling research, thought leadership and emerging practices. Let's have a quick look at, at some of those. So in terms of seizing the momentum, what's uh, uh, essential now from people's perspectives in, in, in their working arrangements is safety, trust and reliability. Um, a lot of uncertainty and instability out there. Um, so really, if work is the place that makes sense, it's becoming the safe place. Um, 
influencing others is a strong thing we have to continue to um, leverage. Uh, so in the responses to the pandemic, uh, we've been influential in helping organisations stabilise in that turbulent period. Um, so we can continue with that uh, and we need to reveal some evidence. We need to agitate some challenging questions to our leaders and our, our people uh, and be courageous in what we do, uh, setting things into a new agenda. Um, but really post pandemic is, is new ground for everybody. So this is where we need to uh, be careful, but also um, very strong in how we influence decisions around people and work. And so those responses we um, crafted during the pandemic um, could potentially become our post pandemic adaptable practices. So we've got to think about what we learned during the pandemic and continue to learn and then what we can apply into the future. So keep the really good stuff and make sure that that's um, continuing to be part of how we operate. And some of that manifests itself in being a culture of inclusive uh, but constant experimentation. So bringing numbers of perspectives uh, into the mix, people from different um, experience levels, age groups, uh, functional roles, um, all combine together and help each other with experiments in how do we create the best version of a productive and flourishing self uh, in order for the company to thrive. Some of that will end up being part of our organization design and operating model adjustments. Um, and some of that will be also influenced by what we can bring in from the outside uh, and what we can help others with by projecting uh, our experiences and to the world uh, so people can learn from us. But well-being has become huge, uh, monstrously important, I say, I suppose, in the corporate uh, agenda. And it's about this. Uh, people aren't as bothered about perks, it's more about care. So things like time, focus, attention, listening are more important to people than memberships and schemes. Um, uh, and there are some new complex and challenging uh, 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 topics that have arisen in wellbeing. Um, fear of return to the office is a thing. Um, vaccinations, uh, people more adversely affected by it. We, we now have more things to um, uh, challenge us than we had before. Um, and there is something about social cohesion in a workplace that maybe is fragmented by remote working, um, but also diverse roles and flexible life experiences are more catered for by remote working. So there's a real balance of togetherness and individuality that we need in this. So more conversations, again, more experiments and more understanding uh, of what makes um, a, a, a strong culture and a good functioning organisation. But there are um, economic cases for care and um, organizations who look after their people in some Harvard Business Review research from a couple of years ago um, proves that there is an equation uh, that links to high performance. So care for your people, high performance. Uh, there's a causal trail within that. And then when we look at the skills of the future, uh, what's um, occurring is that there is an enormous amount of focus in a few areas, um, particularly around performance and value creation. How, how does the work we do create value is becoming an increasingly um, focused topic. Um, and then understanding how people operate, so psychology and behavioural science, is then helping us adjust to maximise that value creation, but be fair to people and work with their energies and their uh, capabilities. And that manifests itself in the design of the experience of work. So I can see why those three are the top considerations for future skills for HR leaders. And then after that, we have more analytics, uh, more design, um, and, and actually thinking about systems and strong emotive um, uh, attachment to work, um, how we learn and how we respond to change. Um, so this skill set, I think, is, become, is going to become the future. Uh, needs and aspirations uh, for HR alongside employment law and all of the other things uh, that we've acquired as a set of professional competencies. So that means we've got to remix. I've got to remix those new skills in with the existing ones and create a different um, approach to how we operate. Um, and it will find itself manifesting in probably four uh, key areas, uh, as I saw it from this research. Uh, much more humanistic leadership. Uh, what people are looking to uh, from leaders is not just being a good steward of the organisation, a good 
uh, captain of the ship, uh, but also being really caring, compassionate and creating certainty for people. Um, so much more of that is being looked for and therefore leaders who, who provide that uh, are seeing a good reaction in their teams and they're seeing that level of capability and competency increase. And workforce planning will become more crucial because as we get into understanding people more and the nature of problems and how we tackle them, uh, how we deploy people to those becomes a much more dynamic spirit uh, than it is at the moment with its functions and, and silos in, in organisational structure. So that's a real strong uh, element for HR to step into. How do we plan where the workforce needs to be and who needs to acquire what skills in order to play a bigger, richer role in that? Linked to that then are the tools that help us. And some of this is about automation helping us create these friction-free processes. So high volumes of work can be um, divested into technological support, but then it gives us the chance to become high touch person to person when it's more complex, more emotional, more challenging. And then alongside that, we've got to get better at how we show uh, trust in people's uh, ability to act on their own uh, direction, so autonomy, and how we remove um, bureaucratic um, friction and interference so that we can optimise the work we do and we don't interfere as an organisation by creating more tasks, more form filling and more distrusting mechanisms. Uh, my chartered body in the UK, the CIPD, ran a hackathon last year uh, called the People Profession 2030. They were looking at collective trends. And, and as you can see from this slide here, there, the summary is fairly similar to mine about technology, um, about its focus on humans at the heart of work, about organisations contributing to um, uh, stability, um, uh, what we can learn from difference and inclusion, um, how we navigate change uh, and what we do for uh, our future fit selves um, so yeah internal change uh, and evolving models definitely digital transformation um, uh, diversity and inclusion um, different employment relationships and a responsible business that is sustainable and purpose-led uh, these were the strong themes coming out from this particular hackathon 2030 um, so organisation design has an enormous part to play in this in terms of the structure, the flow, the decision making, the connecting points, the linkages. Um, so in HR, one of the things I'm recommending uh, for everybody to do is if they're not particularly uh, skilled in organisation design to become more skillful in that area. Because this is what we ultimately want to do. We want to create a state of flourishing for the organisation and the individuals that come to work within it. Uh, so this is a model uh, that I've devised that's included in the second edition of Transformational HR. And it covers um, uh, some core areas that, um, you know, there's an enormous amount to consider in the employer-employee relationship. This tries to bring it to a really... Um, uh, fundamental set of parameters to think about. So if we start on the left, it is about this match of value, what the company uh, can do to create value and what individuals value in their lives. And those two, in terms of some kind of harmony, come together for the meaning that the organisation has in its existence and that the individual seeks from their life. So that gives a kind of reason for being. There's a reason the organisation exists. There's a reason that person wants to do work in that way. And we can flow across the system to a state of flourishing through two core aspects, systems of work, processes, um, rituals and habits, decision making, that kind of thing. And then the energy that people have, the energy they put into their work um, and the energy they get from learning and adapting uh, and becoming a, a, a purpose led um, productive member of the team and so individual components we design the organization and the work we adopt principles that influence the design and vice versa and at an individual level it is about what are we accountable for how clear are we about the things we need and the things we can get from our work and how together are we with other people in, in driving that forward and that often manifests itself in these four areas, how we developed, how we recognise what influence we have and how inclusive the organisation is and how we're included. 
And if we're somehow not achieving a state of flourishing for even the organization, but particularly for the individual, we can use this model to diagnose uh, where the point of failure is. So if somebody isn't flourishing, uh, perhaps they're not fulfilled, uh, so they're not achieving that state of fulfillment. We can work across back from right to left and we can see that it could be, are you developed well enough? Are you recognised well enough? Do you have enough influence and are you included enough? And if the answer to that is no in any or all of those categories, we go back into accountability, clarity and togetherness and say, what are, you, what are you accountable for and how is the organisation accountable to you for development and recognition and, and perhaps what isn't working within that? And if there's a failure in accountability, we can go back into the design or the principles and we can recast that and reset that and look at that. So this tool is meant to be uh, a model of how to uh, enable people to align value and uh, flourish and where it starts to stutter or fail look at the point of failure, work backwards to the solution and then work back through to stop people having poor experiences of work and to create organisations where people flourish. And the HR model of the past looked very much like this um, and perhaps didn't really help as much of that flourishing state as it could do with the vertical assembly of um, shared services for administration, a uh, centre of excellence for specialist um, advice, like learning and reward, uh, and business partners who would deal with people in the organisation, leaders and teams, to make sure that their people, practices and needs were serviced and could be um, delivered. And that model's been around for over 20 years. Uh, and so when I wrote the book Transformational HR, I looked at that model, uh, you know, which I'm very familiar with, uh, analysed it and, and felt that it was time to, to shift and change that. And so here's what I've recommended we do to change it, um, a four zones model. Um, and so the idea is here, instead of verticals that are very specific around uh, you know, talent development, uh, administration and business partnering, um, we'd interlock the circles uh, and create a fourth dimension. So we still have people performance and development uh, who look after things like coaching, business analytics, learner experience, talent acquisition, leadership development. And they're also linking then into other teams uh, in terms of how to uh, deliver that service. And business partners who are in the people strategy and partnerships area uh, about business intelligence, client experience, people data, employer brand, linking with program and support, uh, who, so, who um, do the administration, uh, high volume uh, operations, uh, but also have impact on, the, on their own team's experience within HR. Um, they can support the um, employee experience agenda uh, and so on and so forth. So there are a number of um, crossing points uh, really between those functions. And then the fourth dimension is not necessarily a new team, but a space, uh, people and organizational transformation. And the idea behind this is that we can um, assemble uh, to take on our transformative challenges um, from either of the um, parts of the uh, model here. So people can come from strategy and partnerships, program support, people uh, performance and development, assemble into a team in the transformation space at the top. Um, they can bring other people into a team from different business units and even external um, support and create things like a future skills agenda, a hybrid working approach, research programs, people strategy and change. So the idea is that we're not um, in deficit on business as usual and, and projects being operated in, in the same space. We actually create distinct programmatic operations on our transformation agenda in a different space uh, within HR, uh, which can then become normal practices that, that come back into the mix. So if we transform um, career development uh, through a future skills agenda, uh, we can make that a normative operative, operative state. So that's how these four um, uh, uh, parts of the equation interact. 
And if I go back to those future skills I talked about earlier, performance analytics, psychology, et cetera, if I map them to that particular model, you can see how um, in, in the spine of the model, there are quite a lot of things that manifest themselves as agility, org design, experience design. And then the data science and psychology sits over there and the psychology of learning and performance analytics sits with people, performance and development. So, so we have a number of different ways that, that we can start to see how this model is in, in itself uh, future-proofed and allows for those future capabilities to become much more part of uh, the, the signature and the traits uh, of those particular functions. So that's it really for me. Um, I just thought I'd leave you with uh, this kind of mindset of um, shifting things, uh, creating alternatives and deleting things we don't need anymore. Um, so not reboot, control, alt, delete, but shift, alt, delete. Shift our views, shift our models, shift our practices in line with internal and external change stimulators. So we're really thinking here about how we can create this more fluid, responsive people uh, and HR function and create and craft these alternative ways that deal with all those challenges I've talked through uh, throughout this, the shift in nature of work, where we work, the patterns of work, technology we use and the skills we uh, leverage and then get rid of the old stuff that doesn't work anymore. Delete tired uh, and ineffective and out of date practices because uh, they'll only hold us back. Uh, uh, there's the team uh, and how to get in touch with me. Uh, so uh, yeah, I'm around on LinkedIn. If you wanted to connect with me on there, I'll stop sharing now. And, uh, and thank you uh, for allowing me to talk to you about the future of HR and different ways that work is shaping up. Um, it's a really challenging time, but it's also super exciting. So uh, I hope you've um, got that sense of optimism that I have, um, a sense of realism about the scale of challenge, um, and hopeful that this can become something that helps create much more productive organisations, but also more flourishing people. On that note, I'll thank you and bid you um, a very good evening.